When it comes to self-directed study in the field of philosophy, there are some thinkers that I would say are just unavoidable if you want to be even decently well-read. And Rene Descartes is definitely one of them. So when we're talking about why read Descartes in the first place, well, this is one of the main motivations. If you want to say that you have studied even in a cursory way in the history of ideas, in philosophy, you really do have to engage with at least one of his works, maybe the discourse, maybe the meditations, maybe even the passions of the soul, as we'll talk about. And, uh, you know, I don't think that you can say this of every philosopher or even of most philosophers, but his, his importance, his influence is so massive that even if you were going to take like a world philosophy sort of perspective and, you know, pick like, 10 or 20 thinkers from all of history, there's a good reason for putting Descartes in there, at least, you know, uh, some engagement with this guy's ideas because he, he is so central to philosophy and some of the themes that he's bringing up are, you know, so very interesting. He's making contributions, not only in other fields like mathematics, but in metaphysics, in epistemology, in part in ethics, in the theory of the emotions, in thinking about the nature of human rationality and how we differ from animals and machines. So there is an argument that can be made there, let's just call it massive influence argument. And that's one reason why you definitely would want to study Rene Descartes and his works. I would also say that there's something like, let's call it an aesthetic motif as well. He's a great writer, very clear, at least in parts, and his style is wonderful and sometimes even witty. It's tough to make jokes that last the test of time, but Descartes has in fact done that. And I find, you know, the more that you read his works, at least for me, uh, the more engaging they become. There's, there's certain philosophers, as well as many other people, whose works reward reading and rereading. I first read Descartes for, uh, you know, my classes, I would say, over 30 years ago. And I've read and reread some of his works many times over. I even had a graduate level course on Descartes, which was really quite wonderful, with a professor named Andrew Black. And, you know, we had to read a lot of his works for uh, preliminary examinations. And then I found myself teaching him semester after semester. As a matter of fact, any time that I teach an introduction to philosophy class, Descartes is in there, at least one of his, his works. Sometimes I smuggle both the discourse and the uh, uh, meditations in there. So that, that tells you you know, if my experience is relevant to your experience at all, um, maybe the first reading, the second reading, the third reading won't be quite as rewarding. But if you if you continue with it, you will find that it is quite worthwhile. And the two of these kind of dovetail together, this massive importance, uh, influence motif and the aesthetic motif. Many other people have been attracted to Descartes since he came on the scene and he provides a bunch of reference points that you really do want to know about. So I think those are probably sufficient reasons for why you should incorporate Rene Descartes into any course of self-directed study in philosophy that you plan on doing. With a figure like Rene Descartes, you're not going to have any trouble finding texts and translations of his works. As a matter of fact, we could talk about an embarrassment of riches. There are so many translations into English as well as into so many other languages that you might wonder, well, which translation do I have to start with? And we'll talk about that in a bit. I do want to say that you could probably go to any well-stocked public library or you can find all sorts of things online, of course. You can uh, go to, you know, 
sites or places that specialize in the great books, and you're going to find some of Descartes' works. And he's been translated a number of times. Interestingly, some of his works were actually translated into French. And you might say, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Why would they be translated into French? I thought René Descartes was French. Well, yes, but he, he actually wrote in Latin. And then eventually, you know, some of the works like the Meditations, for example, would get translated from Latin into French because that was a, you know, common thing at the time. So Descartes is, um, you know, available in, in many, many different formats. I've just got a few of my own here just to give you a little idea about it. So I've got a couple, actually I've got more French stuff than I have English here. Um, you know, here's, here's one from Presse Universitaire de France, the Medita Meditatio Metaphysique, which is a, a, a nice one. And this one is actually the same, basically, as this other Presse Universitaire de France version that I have, in that it has both the French and the original Latin. So these are really handy things to get your uh, mitts around. Um, here's the discourse uh, on method with lots and lots of footnotes and stuff like that, even some illustrations. This is uh, another, you know, petit classique borda, right? Uh, here's the passion de l'âme, the uh, passions of the, the soul, the emotions of the soul. And, you know, here's another one that I, I have, and I think I got this one basically when I was uh, supposed to teach an intro to philosophy class, this was the assigned textbook. Here's a discourse on the method from Oxford World Classics. You can find like every publisher who publishes academic philosophy has gotten into the game with translations. I'm, you know, uh, kind of partial to Hackett in part because Hackett translations are usually, you know, well sourced and they're also usually pretty cheap. That's one of the missions of Hackett as a press. Um, now, if you want to go further into studying Descartes, you may, in fact, invest in getting yourself one of the, you know, complete works sets. And there is a, you know, standard reference in French, the Adam and Tannery uh, Oeuvre de Descartes, right? Oeuvre complète. But, you, you know, you're probably not reading French. So you, you might want to say, well, what should I get for English? And there is an older Haldane and Ross 1911 uh, complete works, but a lot of a lot of problems with that, which brought about the uh, publication, well, the project and publication of these two. There's actually a third volume, which is all the correspondence, Philosophical Writings of Descartes, Volume 1, translated by three great Descartes scholars, John Cottingham, Robert uh, Stutthoff, and Dugald Murdoch. And, and these volumes, which are a little bit on the pricey side, you know, to get all three of them, you're talking about about 150 bucks or so. Um, these contain the works, and these are these are the translations that if you're going to be a Descartes scholar or do you know academic writing on Descartes, you're probably going to be referencing these. So you know, if you want to study Descartes, you might invest in getting this, or you might just get your hands on the Hackett, or as I mentioned. Go to a library. You don't necessarily need to buy anything. And, you know, you might say, well, isn't one translation better than the other? Yes, yes, that, that's quite true. But you could compare translations if you want to. And there aren't any that I've come across where I'm like, well, this is atrociously bad. So, you know, you can begin with what's available. There's many uh, that you can easily access online, including you can even find sound files of people reading Descartes' works, not just in Audible or places like that where you have to pay for it, but in LibriVox. So there's a vast variety of Cartesian texts available to you that you uh, might want to, to check out. Now, um, there's, you know, going to be some difference between the translations. Again, you might want to compare them to each other, but you don't need to be overly worried about having the right translation early on at this stage in the game. As a matter of fact, you might look forward to 
getting to read alternate translations down the line, or perhaps even learning French or Latin so you can read Descartes in his original. Now that we have a general question about texts out of the way, it's natural that you're going to ask a different question. All right, which text should I begin with? Or are there multiple texts that I should or could begin with? And if we are approaching things in a completely chronological fashion, then we probably would, would say, well, you should begin with this work that not too many people actually read called The Rules for the Direction of the Mind. Actually, when I took my Descartes class in graduate school, that is what we did, in fact, begin with. But that's probably not the best place for you to begin. And why not? Well, because Descartes deliberately wrote two works to introduce his ideas to audiences, and those are probably the best places to begin with. And so one of them is called the Discourse on Method. This is one that he actually did write in French so that he could reach not just a learned audience, but also, you know, uh, women and servants and everybody else who could read French, right? Uh, and that's a, that's a great work. I, I teach that in my classes. Um, undergraduates really do respond to it because there's a cool narrative within it. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then, you know, a little bit more ambitious, you could say, the Meditations on First Philosophy. Still a very accessible book, though, I would say. Uh, although, you know, there, there are some difficulties to it that re require some maybe explanation or assistance or some attentiveness on the part of the reader. So those are usually the ones that I start people out with. And I actually think it's great to read both of them, you know, maybe the discourse first. And the reason I would say the discourse first is because Descartes in it tells you the story of his own education, his own development up until that point. And then he starts giving you a lot of his sort of standard ideas and arguments and distinctions. The Meditations is also a narrative text, but it goes into a bit more detail about certain matters. There's some things that are talked about, by the way, in the discourse that don't really make it into the Meditations. For example, Descartes' uh, speculations about human beings and animals and machines and what it is that, that makes us uh, really human as, as thinkers, right? But there's a lot of overlap between the two. And in both of them, you're getting really key Cartesian ideas. These are the texts, too, by the way, that are most often referenced by people who are responding to, reacting to, it, reinterpreting Descartes, bringing him into a conversation, oftentimes to reject his point of view. So those are the two works that I would say, you know, are great to start out with. And then you might say, all right, well, what do I, where do I go after that? What do I read next? And I, I think you've got a lot of different possibilities. The first thing I would say is, of course, reread those texts, <laughs> reread the discourse, reread the uh, meditations. But after that, it depends on where you want to go. So if you're looking for things that are, you know, kind of structured in that way, then you might go back to the rules for the direction of the mind. And you might also consider reading a later work that Descartes intended to be something of a textbook. It was actually quite common in the early modern period to try to produce something that would work as a textbook to replace the Aristotle and, you know, perhaps Thomas Aquinas or other things that they were using as textbooks for philosophy in other cases. So rules for the direction of the mind and principles of philosophy. You learn more about Descartes' mindset, system, arguments. He's approaching quite a few of the same topics, but sometimes in alternate ways in those two. Um, another thing you might consider digging into, and this is a little bit more historical curiosity. So Descartes had a book which he was working on when Galileo was condemned. And because Descartes had used some Galilean stuff in there, 
he actually withdrew it from publication. It was in the process of being published. And he's like, whoa, hold off on that, buddy, right? And it was called The World. Now, along with the Discourse on Method, Descartes actually published some of his essays that were drawn from the world. So, you know, you've got the optics, the meteorology, um, there's a treatise on man, and those can all be quite interesting to dig into as well. Those, you know, not so influential, you could say on Descartes' own contemporaries or later thinkers, but they will get reference. And it's a way of figuring out what was this guy up to. Um, another book that I think uh, is very well worth reading, as, as a matter of fact, it would be the third book that I actually have my students engage with, and I've taught it in the past, is The Passions of the Soul, which is written quite late. It's about uh, philosophy of emotion and the mind-body connection, and there's some ethics in there as well. Um, he wrote it in part as a culmination of, of you know, having... Uh, correspondence with Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who's one of Descartes' more important uh, correspondents and a, a brilliant thinker in her own right. A tragic story to her, her life uh, and her family, but um, Descartes certainly recognized her and uh, you know wrote this, this great work. So that may be one that's quite fun to do. It's fairly short. And speaking of correspondence, you might find your way into reading Descartes' correspondence, not just with Princess Elizabeth, but with all sorts of other people, and particularly uh, this, this guy who was at the center of an entire network of intellectuals in Paris, uh, Marin Marsen, who is, is a quite important, not as an original philosopher himself, but as somebody who makes a lot of connections. The other thing that I would mention is if you do read the meditations, there are, uh, along with them, the objections and replies. Now, you could read the meditations originally without reading the objections and replies. It's worth spending time to read those. They, and they include a couple famous people that you probably will recognize, Thomas Hobbes, uh, you know, Pierre Gassendi, you know, which we usually think about in terms of uh, gases and physics and stuff like that. Gassendi was a Epicurean priest and he wrote to Descartes and there were some other, you know, interesting objections and Descartes wrote his replies, sometimes a little bit testy in those. So those, that's like the range of his stuff. You begin with the discourse and the, uh, you know, meditations, maybe add in the, the passions of the soul and then it's where you want to go. And you could select one thing for one year of study and go on to another thing some other time. That's entirely up to you. But I would advise beginning with the discourse and the meditations. So as you're getting ready to study Descartes, hopefully, I'm trying to make a case to you why you should and how you could, you might want to have in mind what Descartes was up to. Every philosopher writes their philosophy not just because they want to make some contribution to human thought per se in an abstract sense, but because they have some real definite ideas in mind what they, they want to do. And so the first thing that I'll say, I mentioned Marin Mersenne, and said that he was part of an entire network, Descartes is writing in a context. He is not just sort of like, as he kind of presents it, like starting from complete beginnings. No, if you look at the discourse, he tells you that he had a certain education, which he sees some flaws with. He tries to determine whether he can come up with a better approach himself. Um, he remains quite indebted to pre-Cartesian, pre-modern philosophy. As a matter of fact, this is a interesting little work that I have here called the Index Scholastico Cartesian by Etienne Gilson, one of the great uh, historian of philosophy of the uh, 20th century. And, you know, it's got all these great entries. It's all in French, of course, and Latin uh, about ideas that, that Descartes brings up. For example, you, God, right? 
And so you see all these things where Descartes is actually bringing up things that are coming up in Thomas Aquinas or uh, in Suarez, you know, or um, uh, this guy, uh, San Paolo, right? Um, and, and so, uh, you know, there's, there's all sorts of interesting matters here. And uh, it's quite good that, um, they, that uh, Gilson sketched this out because it, it removes the idea that Descartes is coming out of nowhere. And as a matter of fact, he is writing to the people of his time, uh, not just the average person on the street, but a, a whole bunch of scholars and church people and, you know, generally interested lay people, like I mentioned Princess Elizabeth as well, right? So that's good to keep in mind. Descartes is writing to an audience that isn't quite us, but includes these other people who we could perhaps relate to. He is now, on the other hand, proposing to provide us with a a new orientation in philosophy. And, you know, he talks about this in the discourse, if you read it. He's looking for a solid foundation that he doesn't feel his education, which included studying philosophy and other fields, provided him with. And so, you know, he thinks that he needs to come up with this on his own, and he thinks that he's succeeded in it. He wants to communicate that to the rest of us. And whether he succeeded or not, you have to read it and find out. Don't take somebody else's word for it. Read the actual text and see what they have to say. Now, the third thing that I'll mention is that he has a metaphor, which I think is very helpful for understanding why he's doing things the way he is, why he's so interested in having a foundation that we can be absolutely certain about, why he's making the distinction between body uh, and extension, what can be mathematized and understood through physics or other things, and uh, the human mind, which, you know, escapes those sorts of things. And that is... He's got this uh, analogy to a tree. At the very bottom, the roots and the beginning of the trunk, that is metaphysics. If you can get the metaphysics down right, then everything else is going to follow. And then the trunk itself is going to be physics. And so, you know, looking at the actual world, and then it's going to have branches, and the three big branches are three M's, one of which is what he calls mechanics, which is what we call technology. And so Descartes thinks that, uh, you know, applying his method and getting rid of all the other stuff that gets in the way is going to lead to a scientific world in which we can develop the kind of technology that you and I basically take for granted. Another branch is morals. Descartes thinks that we can, in fact, have an ethics. He doesn't provide you with any sort of systematic ethics, although there's plenty of spots in his works where he does set out portions of an ethics, and he has a, a provisional morality as well. And so he thinks that we can make progress in this. And then finally, medicine. Now, why medicine? Why is that so important? Well, you know, Descartes actually studied medicine. He, he got a degree in it, and he was very interested in how bodies worked. He was fascinated, for example, with the new theories of the circulation of the blood that you're going to find discussed in Discourse Part 5, right? Uh, he's, he's very interested, as are many of the early modern philosophers like Thomas Hobbes or, you know, uh, Benedict Spinoza, in explaining how the body works and how the body is connected up with the mind. So medicine would include, you know, the physical body and all of its adaptations. It would also include psychology as well. And so, which I suppose you could say also fits into to moral. So that's, that's another key aspect of his motivations, his project. Um, he does in fact have an ethics that you can derive from his work of the use of our minds and how we ought to live our lives. As I mentioned, it's not systematically presented, but you can reconstitute it by reading across 
his works uh, and, and, you know, connecting the dots, so to speak. So that's, that's part of what's going on with him. And he appears to have been a pretty decent human being in many respects. Um, he's not, you know, particularly prideful or greedy or lecherous or anything like that. Um, and then we can, um, you know, talk about the question, well, what is really distinctive to us human beings? For Descartes, we are thinking things. We're not our bodies. Our bodies are a very nice, complicated set of tools that work together to further what it is that we want to do. And I'm pointing at my brain, although that's not, you know, that's only a juncture point for Descartes. It's not where the soul or the mind resides because the mind isn't extended. It isn't bodily for Descartes. And so figuring out reflexively, as we say, there's an entire tradition of French reflexive philosophy that sometimes uh, takes its inspiration from Descartes as well as from other thinkers. Our minds are thinking what our minds are. We're trying to determine that. And that's part of determining what our human nature is. And you might not accept Descartes' own point of view on this as being you know, perhaps too individualistic, right? Ignoring the connections with other minds or souls. But he is certainly putting forth a very interesting, well worth engaging point of view on that. So those are some of his motivations, uh, not the totality of them, but you can say that he is somebody who feels the need to, you know, respond to critics and present things in a way that other people can understand them. And I think that's, that's an admirable trait on his part. With René Descartes, I can give you some advice that is based on the format or responding to the format of his works. And let, let's begin with the discourse and the meditations. Um, each of these is divided into parts that you should look at as, you know, a separate part. You don't want to try to blaze your way through these. Um, you know, if you're like uh, the kind of person who's into speed reading, you want to put that aside when it comes to any sort of deep thinker like Descartes, because otherwise you're going to pass over too much and miss the connections with what he's saying uh, within texts and uh, to, to other matters, right? Thinking about how it would apply to yourself. So the discourse is set up with providing a kind of like explanation of his uh, imperfect education, then trying to derive what the method is going to be. There's two sections uh, working on that. And then there's the arguments, you know, what, what does the method actually yield when we put it into play? And we go all the way through to the end with that sort of thing. The meditations are designed to work a little bit differently. They are indeed meditations. And this doesn't mean that you go off in the corner and, you know, turn the lights down low and, you know, start, you know, uh, sitting in lotus position and, you know, monitoring your breathing. Yeah, I mean, you can do it sitting in a, a chair like this. You just read and think about what you're reading and don't try to jump ahead. Really think it over. I mean, ideally, you could take six days when you're reading the meditations because that's the way they're designed to first, you know, read one and think about those matters and see what our narrator Descartes uh, has to say and think about what thoughts it provokes in you, then go on and pick it up the next day and then go on and pick it up the next day. That's a great way to approach these, these things. And it's, you know, it's right there in the format of the works. I mean, if you want to sit there and read the whole thing in one setting, nobody's going to stop you, right? but you might find that you've missed a few things along the way. You, you want to approach every one of his works as if it is a separate work with its own kind of genre. There, there are similarities between them, right? There's sections and things are numbered and, you, you know, you, he develops things kind of uh, methodically, systematically, systematically. 
Um, there'll be digressions where he's like, well, let's talk about this now, coming back to the point. But you, you know, you're probably familiar with that in philosophers. But don't expect the rules for the direction of the mind to be exactly like the discourse or the passions of the soul to be exactly like the principles of philosophy or the meditations to be like other meditations that you've seen. Take them each as what they are and explore the structure that he puts there. Um, you might also want to try to, as best you can, this is very difficult to do, check your preconceptions, the things that you think you know about Descartes at the door. And this includes stupid jokes like, you know, the bartender has somebody walk in and it's Descartes and, uh, you know, he's asked a question and Descartes says, I don't think so. And then he disappears. That's just silly bullshit that people do, you know, to make memes and all that Put those things aside. Put whatever Monty Python thing you've ever come across. Put the uh, uh, memes and, and you know, uh, reconstructions. Put, also put aside scholarly disputes with Descartes uh, coming from people who you've read who think they know everything there is to know about Descartes. Right? Don't worry about that crap. That's not something that is going to help you. Read the text. See what's actually in front of you. And then... You can come back to that stuff later, right? Um, the other thing that I think is really quite important, go into these texts aware that the use of language has sometimes changed from Descartes' time to our own, and the translations are you know, trying to faithfully render what he's saying. So, for example... In Meditation 3, there's a really important discussion there about objective reality, and, you know, he contrasts that to formal or eminent reality. And when we talk about objective reality, we think about what's out there, what's, what's not an idea, but what is a real thing, right? Well, Descartes means it as the object of the mind, as an idea, Right, the amount of reality that something has as an idea. So you've got to be attentive to the shifts in language. And that's where perhaps um, having resources might help you out so that you don't get tripped up. Um, similarly, there's other terms that, you know, they're not completely changed in meaning in that way, like where it means it's opposite. But where, you know, uh, things could be a bit different than what you imagine them to be. When you run into something, you're like, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that might be a matter of that terminology. The other thing about language that I think could be helpful for you to keep in mind is that although Descartes often disclaims engaging in any rhetoric, you know, he's not trying to uh, pull the wool over your eyes. He's not trying to convince you without having good arguments. He is also a master rhetorician. The way the works are set up, the way in which he proceeds, the sort of things that he says offhandedly show you that he really does know how to use language well to his advantage. And so, you know, you want to be kind of attuned to that. Um, some of the works, this is more of an issue than others. Uh, the Meditations is particularly crafty in terms of its rhetorical construction. So you might want to be attuned to and attentive to that. So that I think that's enough of the advice. The, the only other thing I'll mention is that there are, you know, secondary sources out there that can be helpful. There's like a, a, a vast world of articles about Descartes, encyclopedia entries. And, you know, some of the ones are pretty good. Um, you'll also find books like these two where, you know, I particularly like these. This is why I have them. You know, some, some great uh, uh, sets of essays. You know, Emily uh, Rorty is, you know, a brilliant editor and thinker in her own right, John Cottingham, he's the guy who, along with the others, you know, provided the sort of official translation. And so, you know, you look at these sorts of things. There's also like, you know, Rutledge Companions and stuff like that. And there'll be, you know, a bunch of articles that go into 
depth, that, that connecting the dots that I told you about. These are by scholars who really have thought a lot about Descartes and his, his texts and his claims and arguments. So you might find going to something like this, you know, helpful from, from time to time. Um, that's less about the format of the work and more about, you know, uh, finding useful guides or things like that. So that's probably it as far as advice on format. As always with the sort of advice that I have about how to engage in self-directed study, there are going to be some problems, some issues, some matters that you could raise that I think at the beginning you probably don't want to worry about too much. You, you know, would do a lot better to put those aside for the moment as something you can come back to later on and just see what Descartes is actually saying. Go along for the ride, so to speak. So what are these? Well, the, the first one is, is Descartes totally right about every single thing that he says? Nobody is. No philosopher is. Don't worry about that. Don't uh, get yourself too worked up when you find something that you object to. First of all, you may not actually be understanding things correctly, but even if you are and Descartes wrong about one thing, it doesn't mean that the entire system falls down. You know, uh, I mean, you could say, well, that's not fair because Descartes himself is saying things like that. Sure, sure. That's the methodological doubt. But you don't even know if methodological doubt itself works. And so that, that leads to another thing. Don't worry about whether you truly can doubt everything. Descartes doesn't doubt everything. This is part of his rhetorical construction. Pay attention to what he's doing with his doubt. What the point of the hyperbolic or methodological doubt actually is. And this extends to worrying about, oh man, are we in a simulation? Is this like the matrix? Descartes isn't saying that that's the case at all. You know, that's what uh, you could say second rate pop uh, philosophers will focus in on, but that's only a tiny, tiny little portion of what the guy is actually interested in. And he gets rid of those worries, right? He addresses those those concerns. And by the end of the discourse and by the end of the, uh, you know, meditations, he's already addressed that. And he sure isn't worried about that in the Passions of the Soul or some of the other works where he's already taking for granted that we do, in fact, know things. I think uh, another thing to not make a huge issue of where, like, you have to... Uh, take a stand, dualism of body and mind, right? You may or may not buy into that. You may, if you do buy into dualism, you might think that Descartes is wrong about that. You know, for, for example, the pineal gland being the juncture where brain and mind come together. That's all fine. Don't worry over much about that. Again, try to figure out what the guy is actually saying, what he's committing to, the distinction that he is making between body and, you know, extended substance, mind, thought, substance. And then, of course, there's, there's God as a third pretty much unknown substance. Try to pay attention to what he's actually developing about the mind. As is, also, if you disagree with his theory of the emotions or his psychology, that's all fine, but that doesn't have to get in the way of you actually developing an understanding, you know? First in philosophy comes understanding. Then agreement is something we worry about after we, we fully understand. Same thing with appreciation. You don't have to like Descartes. You don't have to find him as enjoyable to read as I do. But if you do want to understand him, that's your goal. The last thing that I would say you don't really need to worry about at this point is Descartes' views on God, right? Descartes certainly brings God in to some of his discussions. Um, and there is this thing we call the Cartesian circle where God is part of the justification for why we can actually rely upon 
our thoughts and ultimately our senses, right? God not being a deceiver. But you don't really have to worry too much about his theology or his point of view on that. Hearing him talk about God, don't automatically assume that he's a Christian in any robust, substantive sense. That was something that he got criticized for by other thinkers in his own time, like Blaise Pascal, right? Descartes' God is essentially the God of deism. It, you know, he gets the universe going. We don't really know much about him. He structures things in certain ways. But Descartes is very much focused on this world and understanding how our minds and bodies work in this world itself. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, and that's, that's probably enough. Now I, I mentioned that, you know, you can get secondary literature, great, you know, uh, uh collections, uh, anthologies of essays, and you're going to find people, you know, worrying about that sort of thing in there. Like, you know, here's a chapter on the cogito and its importance. Cogito means I think, right? Well, what is the Cartesian cogito? It's not just I think, it's also I doubt, I will, I will against all these other mental acts that are that are in there. Did he get the list completely right? Well, you know, that's what these people might argue about. But at the beginning, you don't have to worry too much about that sort of stuff. So I think you can set aside some of these problems, issues, concerns, not that you can't come back to them later on, not that you can't register them. You might even want to write them down somewhere for yourself. But in your initial, um, actually not just initial, but you know, your first several meanders through the Cartesian texts, just try to see what the guy is actually saying, where he's going, and then worry about whether you agree with it 100% later on. So final thoughts. I'll come back to where I began saying Descartes is really somebody that you ought to read. You know, there's probably quite a few figures where you can take them or leave them. You don't necessarily have to read them in order to have a good background in philosophy. Descartes is not one of those thinkers. Whether you agree with him, disagree with him, love him, hate him, are indifferent to him, um, he really is somebody that if you're going to study philosophy in any sort of well thought out, systematic, more or less adequate way, you want to know who he is. You want to at least read the discourse and the meditations, maybe the passions of the soul. Maybe you'll go on to other things as well. Maybe you choose to read some of the secondary literature, but he's certainly well worth spending the time on. Uh, fortunately, there's lots and lots of resources out there that can help you study Descartes successfully. I myself have produced uh, videos and podcast episodes covering the entirety of the discourse and uh, the meditations, so that might be helpful for you. There's lots of other people who've done similar stuff, but you know, all of that is is nice as an adjunct to you actually spending some time with this great early thinker of what we nowadays call modernity. He's often considered to be one of the fathers of modern philosophy, but it goes beyond that. He's one of the fathers of the modern world. And so I think that you're going to find it's really well worth your time to engage with him. You will, if you put in the requisite time, attention, and work, you are definitely going to get something out of it. And I'll end here. That feels good when you study philosophy and you can take something home. You've got something up in your head that you can communicate to others and even apply in real life.